I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9, verses 35. And this is where we're going to camp for the next three weeks. And, uh, and today, I want to kick off a new series that I believe is in, an imperative part of our Christian walks. Um, something that cannot take a back seat in our journey with God, that will constantly be an uncomfortable inclination. The subject that uh, I want to talk about in particular is a constant interruption, but it has eternal repercussions in the best way possible. And it comes out of a passage where Jesus has already chosen his dirty dozen. He's chosen the 12, um, his disciples. He's preaching, he's teaching, and he's healing. And, uh, and the Pharisees, who are supposed to be teachers and shepherds of God's people, care more about their appearance of being godly than actually being godly. Now, right before this passage, Jesus heals two blind men and a demon-possessed man, and he drives out the demon, and the Pharisees, instead of being in awe of what they just witnessed, they see it as a threat to their leadership. And, and so, so the best thing that they could muster up was uh, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. What, he's, what they're saying is, obviously, he's so evil that other evil things run away. It's the most ridiculous, like, really? That's what you concluded? They are witnessing a move of God that the earth has never seen before, and they blame the healing on the devil. Can we just get something out of the way real quick? The devil is not in the business of healing anybody. Okay, can I get an amen from somebody? So Jesus is frustrated and he's saddened uh, by this this occurrence. And and so he gathers his 12 together and he says uh, something that I believe is just as true today as it was back then. And he's not just calling the ones who walked with Jesus physically, but he's calling us today who walk with him spiritually. You ready? Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 says this. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, someone say the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like, a, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he says to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Another translation says the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his fields or his harvest. If you're taking notes, I want you to write at the top of your page, the fields are calling. The fields are calling. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we love you. We worship you. Holy Spirit, you are here. And I just pray, God, as we unravel this, this beautiful passage that, God, you speak to your people. Let your voice be louder than any other voice in this place. And by the end of this, the next 20, 25 minutes, that, Father, you'll um, do what only you can do. And that has changed the souls of people. Father, we love you. We praise you. And a faith-filled church said together. Amen. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say Amen. amen. Do you know what these are? Look at this, this photo real, real quick from the team. Do you know what those are? They're not like, you know, uh, uh, it's not bear poop. It's not uh, uh, grapes in a dryer. Um, those, are, those are truffles. Now, if you aren't familiar with this delectable dish, um, truffles are an edible fungus. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem very appetizing, but it, they're considered to be a, a culinary delicacy where the very taste of a truffle enhances a dish like to a whole nother level. Truffles are, are small and lumpy with either a dark skin or light coloring. Who, who's had truffles in here? Like you, you've eaten um, truffles. Maybe you've had truffle fries that were fried in truffle oil, um, which is a little bit cheaper. But, uh, but truffles, they're, they're rare and they're expensive. Uh, you can find them at like top tier restaurants. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, by truffles, not necessarily because of their aroma or their taste, but I'm intrigued by the reason why they're so expensive. 
Um, pound for pound, truffles are one of the most expensive foods in the world. Some truffles t- today are being sold for $4,000 a pound. Have you ever been to Harris Teeter? <laughs> to, the, to the meat section? And you go up to the steaks like $25 a pound? You're like, you know what? We'll go, we're eating chicken. You know what I mean? <laughs> chicken thighs again. You know, it's like th- th- $4,000 a pound. That's a lot of money. Now, the reason why is due to how challenging they are to grow, how complex they are to find, and how difficult they are to store. Unlike other types of mushrooms, you can't farm truffles because truffles enjoy a very specific uh, uh, type of growing condition. They prefer well-drained alkaline soil and don't grow above, above the ground but under the ground. They're found near tree roots and form a symbiotic relationship with the tree. And because they're so well hidden, the human eye cannot spot a truffle. So truffle hunters use pigs because pigs have a a good sense of smell, right? Uh, And the only, so they use use pigs to find these, these edible gold mines. But the problem with pigs is that pigs love truffles too. So you, can't, you can train a pig to find a truffle. It's going to be hard to, not, to train a pig not to eat the truffle, right? But once the truffles have been located and, and removed, they need to be sold quickly because they have an incredibly short shelf life, uh, only lasting around one to two weeks when kept in optimal com- conditions. So when you hear a, if you're at a restaurant and it's expensive, and they're like, we've got truffles. Be like, I want the truffle dish in Jesus' name. It may not be good to you, but hey, you gave it a go, right? And paid $4,000 a pound for it. Now, they're expensive because they are incredibly hard to harvest and they're really hard to find. That's why they're expensive. And I think sometimes as Christians, if we aren't careful, we can treat evangelism like a hidden delicacy instead of a ripe field for harvest. The field that Jesus is describing is not minuscule. It is not hard to find. It is a massive field as far as the eye can see. See, I want you to write this down. Evangelism is simply the missionary zeal for the cause of Christ. The missionary zeal, passion for the cause of Christ. Evangelism is knowing that you have a message that is worth telling. See, there are many ways to reach people and to witness to others, yet our flesh overcomplicates it as if witnessing uh, uh, to the people God has called us to is hunting for some rare complexity as if the conditions to our evangelism have to be perfect. It couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, oh, friends, uh, the harvest is ripe. The reason why we do what we do as a church the reason we pray the way that we pray, the reason we believe in the things that we believe in has this one incredible driving factor. The one thing that is going to change our city forever. The one thing that makes the devil cringe in anguish and frustration. The one thing that tears down walls and breaks barriers. The very thing that plunders hell and populates heaven. The very motivation that Jesus, Jesus is expressing in this passage. The word described here in the Greek is that which moves a man to the deepest depths of his being. And that, my friends, is compassion. Compassion. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with what? Compassion. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep with no shepherd. Compassion cannot become a lost art in the community of believers. It is, it's, it's getting weird out there. It's like we, we're like devouring each other in the body of Christ. It's like, whoa, 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 let's have compassion on people. They were weary and scattered. Jesus here describes what a person is like apart from the presence of God. Weary and scattered. They are like sheep with no shepherd. Jesus is compassionately pointing to two things, a neglected flock of sheep and a harvest going to waste because of the lack of workers. And church, my conviction today is to widen the margin of a few. That when you close your eyes and think of, uh, of your sphere of influence and the very community that God has placed you in, what do you see? When you close your eyes, what do you see? Do you see a city in shambles with crime and poverty? That's what the news tells us. Do you see a job that is toxic and pointless? 
Do you see a family that is, is, is riddled with drama and will never live in unity? Do you see your friends never changing and always living sinful, empty lives? When you close your eyes, what do you see? There, there's a great analogy of, of two shoe salesmen. I probably read this in a John Maxwell book or something. I can't remember where I got it from. But there was a shoe company that was sent two salesmen to, rule, to a rural country to determine the market potential of their products in this country. One salesman was sent to the East Coast. The other salesman was sent to the West Coast. Both the salesmen completed a basic survey of their target market and then called back to the office to give an update. The salesman that was sent to the East Coast reported, no one wears shoes here. It's awful. There's no market for our company. So he got back on the plane and he came home. The other salesman sent to the West Coast sent a message. No one wears shoes here. It's amazing. There's a huge market for us here. Send as much inventory as possible. The point of the story is that your perspective influences your belief and your belief influences your behavior. Right? So how, out of that self-help formula, how does that relate to the Christian soul? So I'll ask it again. When you close your eyes, what do you see? Do you see your city changing for the good, being impacted by the compassion of the church so much so that crime dissipates and poverty is impacted? Do you see your job not as toxic, but as a mission field that if my boss and my coworkers just knew how much they are loved by their creator, oh, the things they could accomplish. Could, do you see your, your family that so rocked by the love of God that every broken relationship is mended and made whole? Do you see your friends not at the bar or the club, but standing next to you worshiping Jesus beside you? When you close your eyes, can you see the harvest as ripe or as desolate? Jesus is saying, open your eyes. Do you see what I see? Because I am on mission today to inspire the saints of Wave Church Norfolk that the harvest is ripe, but our Savior, our God, is calling for workers. It's like, okay, okay, Pastor, I hear you, but where in my life is the harvest ripe? Because no, you haven't seen my family. You, you haven't seen the people in my job. The harvest is not ripe. It's gone. There's no harvest. There's no field. It's hopeless. It's like, like, where in my life are the fields calling? Write that question down. Where in my life is the harvest ripe? I'm going to answer it, and it's... it's <laughs> This is mind boggling, so you're gonna just get your pens ready because this is gonna change your life. Where is the harvest ripe in my life? Everywhere. Everywhere. Think of a place, yes, it's there. Everywhere in your life, the harvest is ripe. Oh, Pastor, you don't know my situation. You don't know my... No, no, no. Shh, shh, shh. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere. You know what's interesting is I always used to, like, envy pastors with, like, plane stories because <laughs> they're almost, like, proving that they're traveled. You know, I was on a plane in the Lord. And it just happened. But I have a plane story. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> you ready? Um, so there's this... Beautiful woman. Is, is Carrie Carter here? Is Carrie here? She might not be here this morning. Um, but we have this beautiful woman in our church named Carrie, and she went on the Israel trip with us. And, uh, and what I love about Carrie is she is unafraid. Comple like, she will, she will talk to anyone about anything, and she was sitting next to this Orthodox Jewish man on the plane. Now, if you, you've ever gone to Israel, most likely uh, than not, there will be tons of Orthodox Jews on your plane. The, the men wear black suits and, uh, and grow out the corners of their head. I see the curls. Uh, and some, some will have yarmulkes. Uh, some will have these big, like, ornate hats, expensive hats, and have their hat cases depending on their sect. And then their, the, their women will wear very modest clothing. And they'll cover their head with head coverings or with wigs because once they're married, they can no longer show their hair except to their husbands. Um, they are the definition of religious. Some say Orthodox Jews are the hardest people to reach in the world when it comes to, to 
um, uh, evangelism because of how rigid they are. <coughs> Even Jesus <coughs> got frustrated. <coughs> I need water. Cheers. <coughs> <coughs> Anyone else have water? <laughs> Cheers. Mm. But even Jesus got frustrated with the Pharisees because of how religious they were. Um, and he was so annoyed by them. But the thing is, he loved them dearly and died for them as well. So there's hope for you. Amen? But Carrie strikes up this conversation, and she starts talking to this guy about what she believes and starts asking him what he believes, and it turns into this deep conversation. In fact, he asked her a question that was, was pretty intense. So she goes, well, I don't, know, uh, I don't know that, but my pastor might. He's right there, three rows up to the right, okay? So I'm trying to fall asleep to the new Batman movie, and I get a tap on the shoulder from a young Jewish teenager. And he's like, excuse me, there's a guy, there's a guy who wants to talk to you. And I awkwardly wake up. And there Carrie is waving at me ecstatically <laughs> and joyfully and says, uh, yeah, that's my pastor, right? And so the, the Orthodox Jewish man, you got to think, I, like, I had like a short sleeve shirt. I've got tattoos. I look younger. I have a backwards hat on. And uh, he's like, you're the pastor? And I was like, uh-huh. And he goes, of like a church. And I was like, Yep. Uh, and so <laughs> I was like, what? I don't look like a pastor? <laughs> He's like, no, dude. Um, he didn't say no, dude. I don't think Orthodox Jews say dude. But, um, but he, says, he says, I have a question. Um, he says, now, I have a Jewish answer to this question, but I want to know the Christian one. It's about forgiveness. Uh, I said, okay. Now, you have to understand at this point, in order for him to hear the question, he has to yell at the top of his lungs. He's two or three rows behind me and in the middle seat. I'm on the right section. So he's screaming three rows back and across the aisle. And he says, so now everyone's looking at me, right? Are you the pastor? And Carrie's, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, dang it, Carrie. God, Carrie, you know, and so... And he asks this very awkward question. He says this, very intense. He says, if a man walks into a school and shoots a bunch of people, would your God, Jesus, require the parents of those children to forgive him? That was on a plane. He asked that question on a plane with like hundreds of people on it. Now, uh, now 30, maybe 30, 40 Orthodox Jews are now turned around, awaiting my answer. And so I'm like, what the heck, Carrie? <laughs> right? How am I going to answer this question? And I was like, you know, speaking in tongues under my breath. I was like, all right, God, what, how am I going to answer this? And I had like three seconds to think that. And so I said, okay, well, first of all, your question is loaded and insincere. Um, you've asked this fictitious question before, not because you want my answer, but because you, you're awaiting to respond to my answer. If we can just get that out of the way, that'd be great. And he you know, kind of smirked. And I said, and second of all, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Torah. I believe in what you believe. I believe in what we call the Old Testament, the minor prophets, the prophet Jeremiah and Isaiah. I, I, I believe that. Where we part ways is you are still waiting for the Messiah, and I am not. I believe that the Messiah has already come, and his name is Jesus. See, see the Mosaic law, uh, so now when I say Mosaic law, all these ears are like now, because they're like, oh, he knows our secrets, right? <laughs> mosaic law, there was, so, so in the Mosaic law, there was a price to sin. Jews understand atonement. They do, um, because they can't pay for their sins right now, because the temple's destroyed, right? So they're, so they're, they're now leaning in. And I said, there was a price, and to atone for those sins, there must be a sacrifice. And we believe, as Christians, out of the grace and the mercy and the love of God, he sent the ultimate sacrifice to atone for our sins, that we could not pay ourselves and that you cannot pay yourself. 
So when you say, what does your Jesus require of you outside of your awfully graphic scenario, I'll answer it by saying, how can I not step in the direction of forgiveness when I've been forgiven of so much? The grace of God is so abundant that we have the ability to forgive the most dire circumstances. Now, I have three children. I was like, I got three kids, and Orthodox Jews have like a 1,000 kids. So I was like, I've got three children. I may not choose forgiveness if someone did that to my kids, but I have the ability to choose because I've experienced a deep love and compassion that I've been trying to explain as a Christian for the last 17 years. And there was this deep pause. And I'm just waiting for them to stone him, you know, like start throwing like Torahs at me and blankets, you know, whatever they have, hats, I don't know, yarmulkes. Um, all the Jews around me just started to whisper. And I, I heard a woman in front, she's like, what? He's talking about the grace of Jesus. And her husband goes, yeah, 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 it's fine, whatever. Shh, be quiet. But this rabbi, he ends up being a rabbi that was visiting Israel. This rabbi looks at me and smiles. And he says, I don't think I've ever heard anyone explain the grace of God and their relationship with Jesus so eloquently. Now, I strongly felt the Holy Spirit just move on the hearts of those people. And, and I, just, I just had the privilege of being the vessel. That's all it was. I was just being myself, and I had the honor of partaking in the work. There's nothing insanely special about me. Look at me, church. The fields are calling. The fields are calling. Well, pastor, does the missionary in us ever turn off? You know, when we explain missionary work, I, I used to get frustrated even as a, as a young Christian. It's like, you don't have to go to some far off land in the Amazon to do real missionary work. People are going to hell in Norfolk just fine. And in fact, what I wanna talk about next week is I think a huge shot and blow to evangelism in the 21st century is Christians believing that hell does not exist. When Jesus talked more about hell than heaven. I'm gonna talk about hell next week, is that cool? Is that all right? What the hell? We'll erase that from the tape as well. <laughs> the tape. I'm aging myself. The tape. When does our missionary zeal turn off? Like the missionary in us, does it turn off? Never. Unfortunately. <laughs> I tried in the Dominican Republic. I'm not a pastor. I'm going to be a, a construction worker, you know, just whatever. I was thinking of, you know. But then you start meeting people and they're like, what do you do? I'm a motivational speaker, <laughs> you know. Yeah. To kids, eh, mainly, yeah, children, baby children, Christians, anyway. Never turns off. Our call to be light in a dark place never turns off. And the second we think it's turned off, God has this funny way of interrupting our lives with an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. Why? Because the harvest is ripe. <laughs> the harvest is ripe everywhere. But let's talk about some places it's ripe. You ready? The harvest is ripe in your family. In your family. Well, Pastor, you don't know my family. They're crazy. They'll never be saved, right? Luke chapter four, verse 38 is the story of um, Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. It says this, after leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where Simon Peter, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. I just wanna know, like if I'm sick, I want people to talk about me the way they talked about his mother-in-law. Please heal her. You know what I mean? There's some people where you're like, you know what, Jesus, you can take a day off, right? No, not with this woman. It was like, no, 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 please, they begged, they begged Jesus to, like she was so awesome that she lived with, with Simon Peter. Isn't that awesome? And so uh, it says that standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. 
Amen. And as the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter where their diseases were, no matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Peter got saved and said, oh, Jesus, you got to come to my house. I'm inviting you into my home. And what was a place of sickness turned into a haven of healing. That's a word for somebody in here. Peter invited Jesus into his home and healing took place. And now there is a line of people out of this little doorway in Capernaum that is just waiting to get inside of this home. That'll preach, boy. You can visit Peter's home in Capernaum to this day where they believe one of the first church gatherings started because Peter invited Jesus into his house and his mother-in-law was healed. Anyone here and your mother-in-law needs a healing, right? Maybe of an attitude, you know what I'm saying? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Some of y'all raise your hands. I'm gonna pray for you afterwards. But <laughs> my mother-in-law needs some work, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, I'm just kidding. Pastor Sharon's awesome. The harvest is ripe in your family. Just invite Jesus into your home. Amen? You know what's uh, amazing is when I got, I got saved at 17 and uh, when you're a Christian in a family that is not Christian, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, they're like, I remember you when you were tripping. And you're like, okay, uh, I'm not now. So the, uh, the, I, I remember you know, believing for my family to give their lives to Jesus. And I had this aunt, that had, it was, she might have in, in the past been considered like the black sheep of the family. She had some addictions and, and, uh, and it was an alcoholic for many years. But she was a life of the party, like just um, uh, an amazing, like you're around her and you just feel good about yourself. She's awesome. And, uh, but just really struggled with addiction. And I remember if any, if you would have said this aunt would give her life to Jesus, people would laugh. Um, And I remember when I, when I started to to pastor and preach and we were in the Granby Theater and uh, I'm preaching my heart out and I give the altar call for people to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I see this couple in the back and they raise their hands and who would have thought it was my aunt giving her life to Jesus, weeping in the back of that club. And she came up to me after the service and said, thank you so much, gave me a big hug, tears in her eyes. She had never heard the gospel like that before. I just wanna encourage you, the harvest is ripe in your family. Invite Jesus into your home and watch it become a place of healing and not a place of sickness. Amen? Amen. The harvest is ripe in your job. Oh, Pastor, you don't know my job. My coworkers are crazy, right? Now, jobs come and go. I, I've had so, so many jobs in my lifetime. Like, hopefully this is the last one, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter how important or minuscule positive or toxic, easy or difficult, whether you feel your vocation uh, uh, matches up with your passion or you feel like this is the time of the in-between, wherever you are, the harvest is ripe. Every single job I've had since I was 17 years old, I've had the opportunity to talk to someone about Jesus. Why? Not because I'm special, but because in a job, you spend time with people and over time, people get bored and start asking you about your life and your passions, and if you're a Christian, it is nearly impossible not to talk about church and Jesus in some form or fashion, right? Sometimes you have to get creative with it. But what I've discovered is as Christians, people will come to to you and, and, and seek advice, right? You're just you're like, like searching for answers for their life, and you're like, dude, like you'll have married people come to you. You're not even married. You're like, why are you coming to me talking to me about this, right? They aren't coming to you because of you. They're coming to you because of the God inside of you. And the God that guides your life. What is exuberating from your soul is your relationship with Jesus. So you'll be just chilling in your squadron or at uh, 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 your, your, you know, your, the, the, the office that you're in or whatever, right? At school and people will come to you And go, hey, I I mean, I've just been going through some stuff. Can I talk to you? It's because of the God inside of you. Amen? 
So don't be surprised at that. You ever, I have people, people just come up to me and start talking to me about stuff. Yeah, because you're a Christian. They may not be able to sense it right off the bat, but it's that opportunity. Why? Because the harvest is ripe. Paul did the same thing in Acts chapter 18, verse 1. It says, Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Here Paul is just making tents. And he meets a couple who had fled their home from Roman persecution. And Paul makes the most of the opportunity. He's just making tents. And the, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, not only help Paul in planting the church in Corinth, but also help him plant the church in Ephesus. And they become one of Timothy's greatest encouragers, a leadership couple and a heroes in the faith. And, if there was, and we're talking about them 2,000 years later because someone in their job just thought, yo, I'm gonna reach out to these people. And we're reading about them today. If there is someone in your job God is speaking to you about right now, and he may annoyingly be bringing people's names in your brain, and like, oh man, I can't stand that person. Oh, watch out. Because you may be the one that has enough grace and enough wisdom to reach them. Amen? Amen. And this is what, when it comes to evangelism, simply be obedient. When you have this inclination, like, man, I feel like I should invite that person to church. Oh, I'm not going to do that. That's just me. That's just, you know, the pizza the night before. No, no, no. No, it is, it is you. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to your soul. Invite that person. Talk to that person. Pay for that person's meal. Like, be a Christian. Amen. The harvest is ripe in our community. The harvest is ripe in our community. Our community is our friends, it's our circle, our neighbors, the kids that come over the house to play with your kids, the, the parents at Kid Pickup at our local schools, the barista that, uh, at the coffee shop that you frequent, right? You know, I, I've been visiting our community groups this semester and I'm trying, I'm attempting to visit every single one. The thing is when I said it, I didn't realize how many community groups we actually have. And so now I'm like combining them all. I don't know, I'm going to your community group tomorrow. You don't know that, but you don't know now, right? <laughs> and I'm combining it with someone. So who, is I, who am I combining it with? Eleanor. Eleanor, if you don't know this, I'm going to your community group tomorrow. And we're going to have one together, just so you know. Anyway, it's Peyton's community group. Awesome. Um, <laughs> well, I can do business. I can do two things at once, you know, preach and schedule. Uh, but I've been visiting our community groups and uh, and... For after the CG study for about 10 to 15 minutes, I'll open it up to questions and I'm answering anything that people ha wanna ask about. It can be about anything, about church, about spirituality, about questions in the Bible, anything. Now that's a dangerous thing to do, um, but I'm up for the challenge, right? Uh, and the number one question that I have answered so far in the community groups that I have attended is uh, how do I lead my unsaved friends to Jesus, right? Um, and this is my answer currently until I come up with a better one. There's a quote that is credited to Francis of Assasi, but he probably didn't say it. The quote is this, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. I love that quote. I love it, right? It, it, it is something that we, that, is it something that we make doctrine out of? Of course not. What the quote is bringing attention to is that your words speak loud, but your life speaks louder. Amen? So in other words, how, how, do I, how do I reach people for the cause of Christ? Live like Jesus. Walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. What is the, what is the, the fruit of the spirit? Walk in that and make the most of every opportunity. You know, when I first got saved, um, my, my friends said, ah, Jared will be back. This is just a phase. He'll be back. And, uh, and um, it's been 17 years. It's not a phase. I was so changed by the love of Jesus that I don't want to go back, right? And so I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to me saying, hey, you're just going to have to take some time away from the homies for a little bit. 
just till you, you get strong enough to be able to not be the one influenced, right? And so I did that, and uh, so I just feel like some people are just called to be bored for a while, for the next six to seven months, to get in a community group, get out of, get out, change your atmosphere, right? But you're so afraid of being bored that you're like, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go to what's easy. But the problem is those friends that you're chilling with are toxic to your relationship with Jesus in this season, right? And so, and so I just took some time away just so I could get strong enough, know what I believe. And it's amazing how one by one I'm watching these friends get saved, one by one. It's taken 17 years some, for some of them. We're still believing for some of our friends. But one of the friends that we thought would never give his life to Jesus, he had multiple, he had kids out of wedlock, he, had, he was in and out of jail, um, had a rough upbringing, just like, just, just, you know, was one of those friends like, right, why am I your friend? You know what I mean? Um, but he was fun. And all of our friends were like, man, this is crazy. Um, well, a few years ago, he, he texts me, hey, bro, I got saved. <laughs> Gave my life to Jesus. And now this dude is sending me verses. I'm like, I know that verse. I've been praying for you. I'm going to send you a verse, right? So now... And now he's texting me going, hey, man, we need to get so-and-so in church, bro. You need to go over his house and take him. I'm like, you want me to kidnap somebody? Freshly saved, right? He's, he's on a journey. Some of y'all need somebody to kidnap you to church, right? But it's amazing. And you know, every single time that there was an opportunity to write someone's name down that we were believing for to get give their life to Jesus, I wrote his name down every time. He, his name is on the beams of our Great Net campus. You remember that? When we wrote down the names of the people that we were, you know, his name is in a little baggie and with seeds in it at Seaboard Road. I wrote his name down then. You know, we had a chalk wall here. He, I don't know what is wrong. Chalk wall here. Heel. I did it last service too. The Holy Spirit has a speech impediment. So anyway, um, here, here. There was a chalk wall where we just wrote down people's names that we were believing for when we opened the building. I wrote his name down. And to see this come into fruition is just special. I just want to encourage you, the fields are ripe. They are calling. Amen. The band can come on up, and I'm done. You know, I, I, love, I love MMA. Like, I love the UFC. Anybody else? I love watching people punch each other in the face. I love it so much, right? I'm from Norfolk. I'm sorry. You know, when you, when you have two fighters uh, who have trained their entire lives for this one moment competing at the highest level of their craft, it's amazing. So much fun to watch. I nerd out over jujitsu moves and stuff like that. One of my favorite moments before a fight, though, is the face-off. I love it. Because they just look in each other's face, trying to punk each other. More times than not, you can tell who will be victorious in a face-off. Why? By, beyond their skills, beyond their winning record, what? The zeal in their eyes. And I think when it comes to our Christianity, some of us have been training our entire lives. We've been sitting in church for years. And in the beginning, we had zeal and passion to see people come in, into a relationship with Jesus. But now when the opportunity comes, it's just like, oh my gosh, it's an interruption. I don't want, like, just, I don't even want to be here. When those inclinations used to be strong, they're now dampened. And it's easy to just walk out of the store. It's easy to not, uh, uh, you know, use that bait that God has given you to hook someone to a conversation about Jesus, right? I just want to inspire, to inspire us this morning, especially veteran Christians, to get the wind back in your sails, to get that zeal back in your heart, to see people who don't know Jesus come to know him and find hope and life in a relationship with him and be written in the Lamb's book. Come on, don't ever give up on people. Just continue to believe. Get that fight back in your soul because eternity is at stake. Amen? And that's the whole reason why I'm talking about hell next week. And it's kind of it's spooky season. You know what I mean? Why not talk about it? You know?
You know, when we went to Israel, we went to this hotel in Tiberias. Um, it's on the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, and the guy, the manager of the hotel came up to us and, and um, was showing us the amenities and everything. And he's like, hey, guys, I just want to let you know, um, every time I see a Christian group come into the hotel, I'd stop them and I'd tell them my story. And he goes, just real quick, I was an Orthodox Jew and there was a pastor that came here uh, with a group of people and they just took the time to talk with me about Jesus and I gave my life to Jesus right then and there. He goes, I am a Messianic Jew and I've forever been changed by the cause of Christ. And I just wanna encourage you um, that your conversations with people here, because Tiberius is mostly Orthodox Jewish people, he goes, I just want to encourage you, every conversation that you have here does not fall in deaf ears and make the most of every opportunity. And I felt the Holy Spirit stop me and go, that, that, don't lose that. Don't lose that. Remember when you got saved and all you wanted to see was Bayside High School saved for the cause of Christ. And then you graduated and all you wanted to see was Old Dominion University saved for the cause of Christ. And then all you wanted, all you wanted to see was Granby High School and, and, and all, all, like Norfolk just, start, shh, just started to broaden in my heart. Don't, don't lose that. Don't lose that. A lot of times, the longer we spend time on earth, the more we see, the more our hearts become callous to the things of God. And one of the first things to go, beloved, is passion and zeal. Come on, get zealous again. You know, I heard a preacher say one time, preach every message as if your son who is away from God is sitting in the back just giving God one more chance. That, oh, that got me because I've got two sons. And I wonder if we had that type of zeal when we're out in our community. And God puts on our hearts the waiter or the family member or the neighbor who just keeps showing up in your front yard that we would make the most of that opportunity. God, show me ways to reach my family, my friends, my coworkers, my neighbors. And this is what's dangerous about that prayer. He will answer it. Just make the most of that opportunity, amen? Romans 10 verse 13, and I'm done. This is my favorite verse in all of the Bible passage. My favorite by far, until I find another one. Haven't found one yet. Romans 10 verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Does it say some people? Does it say uh, the rich? Does it say uh, uh, the, the good? No, no, no. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one who they have not heard? And how can someone hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And I just wanna encourage you as your pastor this morning, I am sending you. I am sending you. You don't have to know everything about the Bible. You don't need, you don't, Listen, it says that in the Bible that when the, the uh, uh, disciples would show up to places, that they were unlearned men. But they had spent time with Jesus. Spent time with him. And watch. Look, Carrie Carter. Excuse me. Who knows what, what seed that is going to plant in that man's heart. Come on, somebody. Amen. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you are in this place, and you do not know Jesus, I wanna pray with you and for you. Maybe you're the classic American Christian who, who's like, oh man, I, I do the checklist. I check off the box. I went to church on Sunday so my mom doesn't get mad at me. I sprinkle gifts into the offering when I have cash, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I wanna pray with you and for you. And I promise you, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you to the front. I just wanna know who to include in this prayer saying, Pastor, I've been moved by the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, it is not because of my charismatic preaching or the piano in the background. It's none of that. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. He is the only one that can change and fashion the soul. And if you're here this morning and you do not know him or you need to rekindle that relationship with him, again, I wanna pray with you and for you, but I need to know 
who, who, I, who I include in this prayer. If that's you at the count of three, I want you to lift your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. You can put it right back down. Hands are already starting to go up. The count of three. One, two, three. Come on, lift it. High enough and long enough for me to see it. Beautiful. Beautiful. I see those hands in every section. Awesome. 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 Come on, lift them high enough and long enough for me to see it. Awesome. I see those hands. Beautiful. You can put your hands down. Just a few seconds longer. Is there anybody else? Come on, God loves you. Loves you so much. I don't care what some preacher said, some teacher, some philosopher, family member. If there is breath in your lungs, there's still a calling on your life. Jesus did not come so that bad people can become good, but that dead people will come alive. And some of you are dying inside. And this is the one thing, this is the only thing that can satisfy the soul is a relationship with Jesus. Come on, lift it, lift it. Beautiful. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we're gonna repeat this. I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. We say this prayer every week in our church. It's a prayer of salvation. We'll say it together. Say, today, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. You died for me and you rose again to give me a future, to give me a hope. God, I repent. You have forgiven me of my sins. And I now live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen.